Welcome to CounterPoint. I'm Tanya Granik Allen. It's been a year and a half since the unprecedented pro democracy protests broke out on the streets of Cuba. Since that time, many thousands have been arrested and many still remain in detention. Recall that Cuba has been a communist country for about 60 years and is the poorest of any Latin American nation. The government, headed by Miguel Diaz Canel, controls nearly every faction of life from electricity to food to the internet. The island struggles with daily power blackouts, public transportation problems, as well as chronic food, medicine, and fuel shortages. COVID restrictions have impacted tourism for the past two years, and as a result, poverty has only intensified. But the pro-democracy protests are a breath of fresh air for the Cubans who are so hungry for freedom. Many have hope that democracy will be restored in their lifetime and, and continue. But are these hopes founded? Are Cuba's alliances with fellow authoritarian regimes like Russia and China going to thwart any chance at democracy? And what can Canada do in all of this? Well, joining me now is Michael Lima Quadra, founder of Democratic Space and representative for the Council for Democratic Transition in Cuba, and Sarah Teak, international human rights lawyer and senior fellow at the McDonald Laurier Institute. Thank you both so very much for joining me. It's been about a year since we've had an update, Michael, so I really do appreciate you joining today. And maybe we'll start, and as well as you, Sarah, because you're going to bring a very interesting perspective to all this. But why don't we start with you, Michael? Could you give us an update on the democracy movement in Cuba? Well, after the July 11 protests, Tanya, were over 150,000 people protested in Cuba. And that's July 11, uh, 2021. July 11, 2021. Uh, most they, they were uh, many were arrested, sent to prison, uh, torture. They were uh, involved in, in due process. In, they were la lack of due process in all those uh, legal processes. But yet, the spirit of resistance has continued in Cuba since uh, July 11. Protest has not stopped, even though the regime unleashed uh, a wave of repression during the July 11 protests. Just this October of 2022, 589 uh, protests took place in Cuba, and wow. most of them were to demand civil and political rights. Uh, people in Cuba realized that uh, unless the system change, unless there's democracy in Cuba, and, and you can see that in, in the protests where people chant freedom, nothing is going to change in, in, in Cuba. They are protesting uh, for the repression that has unleashed since July 11, mm -hmm. the political imprisonment is the biggest human drama that Cubans are facing today in the island. They are protesting also conditions, economic conditions of poverty. 70% of Cubans live in, with less than $1.50 a day. Mm -hmm. So they realize that food, the, the issue of famine, lack of food, comes from the policies of the government that handles all the agricultural production in the, in the countryside. Plus, we have a regime, we have a military elite that runs the country through the Gaesa uh, Entrepreneurial Corporation, and they, they, ha they, they spend like half of the country's revenue in building more hotels, but a very small percentage on education and health care. So, so you have a 30, 30 to 1 difference. There's a 30 times more investment in building hotel and infrastructure than in taking care of the, of the needs of, of the Cuban people. So... Well, I want to I want to show some of these photos of some of these um, more higher profile, if you will, prisoners in in the Cuban prisons. Um, do you have any comments on any of these individuals? I mean, we have we have the leader, we have the minister of the armed forces, we have the minister of the of the interior. Those are the two armies that that handle the repression in Cuba. The armed forces control all the all the three regions of Cuba: the eastern, the central, and the western. Uh, regions of Cuba, so they have absolute control over those regions right. uh, to manage all the bureaucracy. They, they are above the political, the, the Communist Party. And I'm and, sorry, I should clarify, these aren't, sorry, photos of those imprisoned. These are uh, photos of those uh, for whom we are going to be requesting sanctions, yes. or are you requesting that there will be sanctions? Ten Cuban officials, including Miguel Diaz-Canel, who is the president of Cuba, unelected president of Cuba, and then we have the heads, the, the interior minister, the minister of the armed forces, the chief of police, we have uh, people in the, the, the one that uh, directs the penitentiary system, individuals leading the political directorates My within goodness. 
Interior Minister and the Armed Forces. They, they coordinate, they are the responsible for persecuting people on July 11 and recently in the protests in August, September and October. Okay, we're going to pick this conversation up in just a moment. Welcome back. We're getting an update on what's happening in Cuba with the pro-democracy movement. And again, joining me is Michael Lima Cuadra and Sarah Teach. Uh, Michael, before we went to commercial break, you were kind of framing what has happened in Cuba. Of course, there were those uh, massive, the massive protests of July 11th, 2021. There has been more since, more protests recently in the last few months. Have things worsened since the initial wave of protests, of arrests rather, following the July protests since the July pro-democracy protests of, of 2021. Do you feel that the situation with the government, it, it, the situation for the pro-democracy freedom fighters has worsened, Michael? Yes, it has worsened. And that's one of the reasons why people are protesting in Cuba. They're protesting against the brutal repression that has taken place since July 11. Cuba now has more repression than levels of repressions are higher than in the past two decades. So they're responding to police abuse. That's one of the, the main triggers that, of the protest. There was recently a group of immigrants that tried, a group of Cubans that tried to leave Cuba in a boat, uh, 23 of them, and seven were killed by the, by the Coast Guard. And that was uh, October wow. 28, uh, including a two-year-old that, who was killed in, the, in, in that uh, it was intentionally from the Coast Guard to ram the boat and kill them. So that triggered protests in Bahia Onda, which is in, in Havana province. The situation in prisons are, is, are terrible. They, there are NGOs like prisoner defenders that have reported uh, torture. Uh, political prisoners are subjected to different types of tortures in prison. And that was a report sent to the United Nations uh, Working Group on, on Torture. The conditions of people, the, the, the repression, the repression instead of, of silencing protests is, is getting more people to protest in Cuba. There's a culture of protest. People understand that without pressure, there is no change. So that's why they are taken to the streets. And uh, even though there are particular triggers, like a national blackout after mm -hmm. Hurricane uh, Ian hit Cuba, when you hear what people are asking in the protest, the way they are conducting the protest in front of the different a Communist Party headquarters in the different localities across Cuba, you realize there is a political uh, intention in the, in the protest, that people want democracy, that they, they want freedom. They understand that only by changing the system that their lives uh, would improve. Sarah, I want to bring you into the conversation. You're an international human rights lawyer. Uh, what you're seeing in Cuba, I mean, we see, we see protests around the world. We've seen Iran. We've seen what's happening, obviously, with the invasion in Ukraine. We've seen in other jurisdictions in China. We don't hear as much about Cuba. We did initially, but we, we in July 2021, but we don't hear as much. Why is that? It's a good question. Um, it's, you know, I think a lot of it has to do with uh, sort of media, public awareness. Cuba sort of is, maybe part of it is Cuba seen as like a, a small a small foe, if that, but then what's missing from the conversation are these links to Russia and China. Right. And now you've um, outlined, and I know you've published some work, and as, as well as, as Michael here, on some of the troubling alliances that Cuba has fostered, uh, and you name, like Russia and China. Explain, you know, why, say, for example, an alliance with China is a concern. Sarah. Right. So, I mean, in general, there's a growing collaboration and alliances between uh, autocracies around the world. And we see that not just with Cuba, but more broadly. And when it comes to China, so China controls a lot of the tech infrastructure in Cuba. And sort of in exchange, we see Cuba parroting uh, CCP talking points in international fora. We see uh, Cuba borrowing methods of repression that the CCP has long employed, like uh, internet censorship and shutdown. So there's a collaboration and information sharing and a mutual support in these international institutions that's really, really troubling. And with Russia, where is the collaboration? Where do you see that collaboration going? So, I mean, it's similar. Cuba has been supportive of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and international institutions. Um, and that support, you know, goes both ways. We also see that, you know, I've talked about China and Russia, but there's also Iran 
uh, Iran has loaned Cuba um, a lot of uh, a lot of money, and they've leveraged that for influence as well. There were reports a while back of Iran using Cuba as a, a launching pad to uh, do a cyber attack against the U.S. Oh There's goodness. alliances with Venezuela, whereby Cuban officials are actually training Venezuelan uh, military in their repression of the Venezuelan people. So it, it's also broader than just China and Russia. My goodness. Uh, what you described there is, is, is you know, it's, it's a very unholy alliance, very troubling alliance if you have all these authoritarian regimes coming together and acting as a block. Uh, we have seen this in the past, of course, but, you know, in the 21st century, who thought? We're going to pick up this discussion in, in just a few moments. Welcome back. We're talking about the pro-democracy developments in Cuba and what can be done around the world and what is actually happening with some of these new alliances Cuba has fostered with countries like China and Russia and Iran. Uh, Michael, I want to get back to you. You know, we've heard from Sarah explain some of these very uh, distressing alliances that Cuba is forming with Venezuela and Iran, countries like this. How is this, are local Cubans on the ground, are they aware of what their government is doing and how they're working with these other authoritarian regimes? Yes, they are. And in fact, there, there has been reports of uh, over a thousand Cuban doctors that have been sent to different countries in Latin America, to Venezuela, Brazil, who have, first of all, uh, reported conditions of modern slavery. When, when those missions are sent to those uh, countries, they have connections with all of Latin America and different parts. And, uh, so the, the Cuba, doctors are being sent and enslaved, basically? These yes, other? yes. They, they garnish 80% of their they're salaries. They're forced to go. Yeah, they're forced to go. They, oh, e even though they're, they're the best health professional, they go to those countries on, the, on conditions of, of modern slavery. So like 80% of their salary is confiscated. Their, their passport is confiscated. So Cubans realize there is an alliance. There is a connection with all of those Latin American nations. It's been like that for, for, for three decades. And with authoritarian nations, uh, to follow up on what Sara was, uh, was mentioning, it creates, a, when, when Cuba lies with China, for example, it creates a, a culture of impunity, of justifying gross uh, human rights violations. Hmm. So for example, China ha has committed genocide against the Uyghurs, and the Cuban regime, through his vast diplomatic influence uh, that's been for, for decades, has been able to get support from 60 countries on October 21st of 2021 and justify, even praise human rights, the uh, uh, respect that China has in Hong Kong, Tibet, and, and, uh, and with the Uyghurs. So those, those connections suggest that what happens is in Cuba matter because it's, it affects uh, justice around the world. It, it fosters impunity. And with Russia, disinformation is also an issue. Mm. Canada is fighting this information, yet even here in Canada, uh, there is a satellite that is being allowed by Cuba Vision, by, by the CRTC, which is Cuba Vision International, that broadcasts here in Canada. And it's repeating, the Cuban state television is repeating the same propaganda points that the Kremlin repeats on the war in Ukraine. And we have it here, it's one of the, of the channels that is allowed by the CRTC on satellite here in Canada, is Cuba Vision International. My goodness, my goodness. Sarah, there are some tools that governments have at their disposal if they want to, you know, affect change and, and promote democracy. And one of those things are Magnitsky sanctions. And I've, I remember speaking about this, uh, I think when discussing Iran a couple of years ago. Could you explain to our viewers who may not be familiar, or what are Magnitsky sanctions? Sure. So Magnitsky sanctions are a really, really useful tool that we have domestically. Um, it allows the Canadian government essentially to impose targeted sanctions on human rights abusers or foreign officials that have engaged in significant corruption. Magnitsky Acts also exist around the world. There's one in the U.S., there's one in the U.K., the EU, Kosovo, Norway. Uh, there's a, a long list and it's growing. So that's really, really useful as well for Canada to act multilaterally. So if uh, a number of rights respecting countries impose sanctions at the same time, that actually has a lot of impact. Uh, Canada, unfortunately, has not sanctioned any Cuban officials for human rights violations. Despite you know Trudeau and, and the Foreign Affairs Ministry both condemning the crackdown of the July 2021 protests, that hasn't been followed up with meaningful action in the form of targeted sanctions. 
The U.S. has imposed targeted sanctions in response to the July 21, uh, 2021 protests as well. So this is sort of a... So this you said the U.S. A, has imposed those sanctions? They have. They have. Yes. Yeah. So, and actually, in fact, every single uh, official that we've asked global affairs to sanction, uh, except for the current president, unelected president, has already been sanctioned by the United States. And so, we can bring up those photos now, if, if possible. Um, yeah. But these are some of the individuals that you that are sanctioned at the U.S. and you'd like to see Canada sanctioned as well. Exactly. So we had a number of meetings in Ottawa recently, including with the Global Affairs Canada, asking for sanctions on these officials. And the response? The response uh, was that they would think about it. There was a lot of hesitancy. You know, Canadian <clears throat> policy in Cuba has been sort of marked with a, an anti-U.S. embargo stance. And sort of our point in response to that was these are actually consistent positions, regardless of what stance you take on the embargo. The embargo is a broad-based sanction. Magnitsky is targeted sanctions on particular officials or particular entities with responsibility for human rights violations. Okay, Sarah, so we're going to go to cut to commercial break. I'm going to pick this up in just a few moments. Sure. Welcome back. We're wrapping up our discussion on Cuba and its fight for democracy amongst the citizens. And joining me again is Michael Lima Quadra and Sarah Teach. Sarah, before we went to the break, we were discussing Magnitsky sanctions. Uh, why don't you think Canada has employed them thus far? So when it comes to Cuba in particular, Canada likes to position itself as different from the United States, and particularly in relation to the embargo. There's the U.S. embargo on Cuba, and Canada has consistently um, voted against that in international institutions. So, But I think this really sort of stems from, in a way, a misunderstanding of the difference between broad-based sanctions and targeted sanctions. A country can have a, a global affairs can take a position that's against broad-based sanctions, uh, in general, or in particular when it comes to Cuba, but can still be very much in favor of imposing targeted sanctions when they're appropriate uh, to sanction human rights violators. Which is what Magnitsky sanctions are. They're very targeted. Exactly. Wow. Okay. Um, Michael, what do you feel Canada should be or ought to be doing to support freedom in Cuba? We're a democratic country. Shouldn't we be supporting more democracy everywhere? Isn't that the right path? Well, what should we be doing in Canada? Canada should take a closer look at what's happening in Cuba, uh, get information from human rights defenders. Uh, October of, of this year has been the, the, the month with more protests, even more than July, uh, July 11, 2021. So Canada should take a closer look. Uh, the, the constructive engagement policy that Canada has had with Cuba since 1994 has not worked. Uh, I understand that back then, when Jean Crochet was prime minister, there was an idea, a certain certain a concept of a foreign policy of bringing up human rights topics behind closed doors. That doesn't work with dictatorships and authoritarian regimes in general. The, the way that all the countries should approach the issue is by publicly condemning what is happening. And since the, the foreign policy of Canada has not a, created a, an open society in Cuba, or at least it has not contributed to human rights, we think it should change. And w one of the ways it should change is with Magnitsky sanctions. Uh, Prime Minister Trudeau and the Minister of Foreign Policy have already made statements against uh, repression on July 11, 2021, but they, but they have not taken any action. So we believe that with the Magnitsky sanctions, that would be the, the right step. It's, it's a matter of <coughs> justice for the people of Cuba. In Cuba, People don't have any access to an independent judiciary or an independent media, so they are defenseless. And then the international community, and Canada in particular, can play a key role. As Sarah was mentioning, the U.S. has already sanctioned all those officials except the Canal, with Canada uh, approving in case they, they accept to go ahead with the sanctions. It would be working in alliance, as human rights organizations point out. Democracies work better when they unite against right. authoritarian regimes around the world. In this case, uh, the Cuban dictatorship. Um, and I want to point mm -hmm. out, Sarah, that um, I don't know if, if this is an honor or not an honor for you. I would consider it an honor. But you are one of the Canadians to be named and banned from Russia <clears throat> and from entering the country of Russia because of what your outspoken <clears throat> positions on human rights. Uh, what do you make of that? 
I think it's an honor. <laughs> I, I consider it a badge of honor for sure that my work has enough impact that Russia is taking notice. So do, will, will Cuba do something similar? We were saying that they're sharing notes with other authoritarian regimes. Will they start banning people from entering their country? I mean, obviously, there are limited travel already within the United States. Many Canadians flock to Cuba, Sarah, for, for vacations. Is that the right approach? I mean, I, I don't I don't know. I don't know how to predict that. That's not a, something that's consistent across the authoritarian regimes with China, for example. I'm sure I, if I went to China as well, I would be arrested uh, pretty quickly. I've actually done more work on China than Russia, but I'm not on a pub public list. They don't really tend to do that. So I, I'm not sure what, what Cuba would make of whether or not to publicize a blacklist or not. They and you go ahead, Michael, you want to chime in? Yes, they already have a blacklist. They don't publicize it as Russia does, but there are many human rights activists that cannot go back to Cuba, one of them. They, even though the penal code says that if you work outside of Cuba to defend human rights and support people inside, you, will be, you have legal consequences. And there are even activists in Cuba that are banned from leaving the country. So that's going on in Cuba as well, even yes. though they don't publicize it. It's true. You can only leave the country with permission in many cases. Is that correct? Yes. My goodness. Well, I mean, we have to have hope that things will be better. Hopefully we'll see some Magnitsky sanctions imposed. But thank you both so much for joining me. Uh, we're going to follow this issue because this is something I, I think we really need to shine a light on. So thank you both very much today. Thank you. Thank you for thank having you. us. The fight for democracy in Cuba is very real, and we have to have hope that the uh, fight will come to an end soon with Cuba being restored as a democratic country. For CounterPoint, I'm Tanya Granik-Allen. Mm -hmm.